you know, real emotional health is not about a kind of stoicism. Well, actually, stoicism is pretty good as a philosophy, but it's not about just being st stony. It's about your ability to expand and absorb, and the willingness to say yes to both your emotions and things that are happening. Hi there. Welcome to Students of Mind, the mental health podcast made by curious minds for curious minds. On this podcast, we the hosts are just like you, eager to learn more about the mind. Here we learn with you and provide you with clear, concise information backed up by real experts about all things mental health. My name is Jade, and in today's episode, I'm sitting down with Emmy Lowe to discuss what it means to be emotionally intense. So today's guest is therapist, author, and podcast host, Emmy Lowe. Emmy is the founder of Eggshell Therapy and Coaching, a practice dedicated to treating individuals who are emotionally intense and sensitive across the globe. Along with being a clinical psychotherapist, Emmy is a certified art therapist, social worker, EMDR therapist, and mindful teacher. Emmy was granted the International Endeavor Award by the Australian government for her clinical and academic excellence. Her work has been featured on many popular publications, including the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, and Talk Radio. Welcome, Emmy, and thank you so much for being here. It's good to be with you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. So I know I said a little bit about some of your work, but you have this is such an amazing journey and story. So can you say more about yourself, the work you do, and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so as you have said, I work with highly sensitive and intense people, and many of them don't feel like they fit into the mainstream society. So maybe all their lives they have been told by their parents or people around them to say they were too much too strange, too difficult, or even too dramatic. I myself identify as being quite a misfit, that I don't really fit into the conventional uh, norm myself. And when I discovered these concepts, um, it was a relief to know that I'm not the only one. So my job now is to help people to go what I call from healing to thriving, or to go from being the misfits to being the leaders of the world. Healing because there are probably a lot of childhood trauma from being misunderstood, pushed to the side, um, dismissed from when they were younger because a lot of sensitive and empathic people carry certain roles and responsibilities in their families that might have wounded them. But we also don't just want to heal, we also want to thrive. So really helping people to harness their unique gifts to own who they truly are. I mean, a lot of intense people, perhaps at some point in their lives, because they have been repeatedly rejected, they might have taken an, what I call an unconscious vow. <laughs> like they've signed the contract to hide who they are because they have been hurt and betrayed too much. So then they develop this what, what we call in psychology a false self, which doesn't mean they're fake or false. It just means they have got an adapted social facade that has been edited to survive in the world. And by doing that, they might have lost touch with who they really are. So they make themselves invisible. They have these imposter syndromes, for example, to avoid the judgment, the teasing, the shaming. They've mellowed out. They've mellowed out their intensities to fit in. So a lot of my work is helping people to own, claim, reclaim who they are, to really feel in their body and their soul that actually there's nothing wrong with them. It's about reclaiming who they really are authentically. And in that journey, I also teach people to maybe look at some of the relationship challenges, such as finding partners who might also be like you, or at least have an understanding of who you are, and some of the workplace challenges that they may face. 
so yeah, there are many aspects to my work. I can go on forever, but I think that probably answers your question. Yeah, that's great. So you you talk about this concept of emotional intensity. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? I feel like a person who may not be emotionally intense might hear that phrase and not think it's something that affects someone um, extensively. Sure. Uh, so, so can you kind of explain it? I summarize emotional intensity as a concept to com- be comprising of five components. To just read them out, they are number one, emotional depth and passion. Number two, deep empathy and sensitivity. Number three, being highly attuned and perceptive. Number four, having a rich inner world, which also comes with a, sen- uh, a degree of intellectual intensity and probably vivid imaginations. And number five, creative potential and the experience of existential angst. So on the surface, they may be a deep thinker, they may be an intuitive feeler, they may be highly empathic and they observe a lot. And when something moves them, like art or music, they feel really ecstatic. But when they're sad, like when watching the news or seeing people suffer, they do really, really feel it in the core of their heart. And they may find that what works for others don't work for them. They can't hold down something that is conventional, maybe the corporate ladder or a stable and predictable thing. And maybe I can go into the descriptions a bit more of each of these categories too. Yeah, that would be good. So yeah, with emotional depth. So maybe whether or not they express it outwardly, they feel things deeply, intensely, and then they may feel both positive and negative feelings at the same time, sometimes very quickly, one after the other. They sometimes they describe it as um, having a washing machine full of feelings. It's constantly looping. They may be very deep thinker. Even when they were young, they felt like an old soul that's much more mature and deeper than people around them. They can be extremely passionate. They can come across as being obsessed. They may be infatuated with people or ideas. Usually, they don't like small talks. Even if they're an extrovert, they just have very little tolerance for the social niceties. Mm. Or they can't talk about the weather extensively. (laughs) So they really want to have meaningful connection with others. And then they have very deep empathy and sensitivity to the point where sometimes they identify as being empaths, which means they absorb other people's energies. Like, for example, when they walk into a room, they may feel feelings that are not theirs, like things that other people feel, but they're unsaid. They can feel it in their body. So as a result, they may find things like crowds or social situations really overwhelming and exhausting. They may have what other people call a thin skin, so they feel hurt quite easily. Perhaps they overanalyze interactions with others. They can be quite overwhelmed by things like noise, strong smells, sensations from rough surfaces, and etc. So they may have other body symptoms like migraines, allergies, digestive issues. They are also highly attuned and perceptive, so they often see beyond the surface. For instance, they can tell when other people are lying, even when it's not obvious. So sometimes they come across as being psychic. Mm-hmm. They're also often the whistleblowers who reveal what is in the room, but it's inconvenient to be known. And some of them, quite a lot of sensitive and intense people are also spiritually sensitive. So they are attuned and drawn to spirituality, not necessarily religious, but spirituality from a young age. They're also wildly imaginative. Many of them have has imaginary friends when they were younger. And many intense people are also, intellect, also intellectually intense. So emotional intensity and intellectual intensity often go together. So they have a fast brain that processes information quickly. The mind runs on multiple tracks. They can see the deepest potential of things. But many of them also have what I call an existential angst. So for unknown reason, they feel the weight of responsibility on their shoulders, even for things that they're not really responsible for. So they feel a sense of urgency and a constant impulse to move forward. They have very high level, high standards for themselves and others. 
So what seems normal to them can seem perfectionistic to others. I can go on and on. Yeah, it's interesting hearing all of the stuff because it feels like I'm like hearing about myself. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering, with emotionally intense people, we see their behaviors, but if we go like inwards and look at the brain, is there a way that emotional intensity shows itself in the brain? Mm, that's a very, very good question. And I wish I had the fMRI machine and the resources <laughs> to do that. Um, I don't, but I do think, I do say being intense is a brain difference. It's, it's a temperament. It's, we come to the world. I, I'm not sure how much of it is nature and how much of it is nurture. I do believe that there's a big part of it that's coming from nature. In 1995, Dr. Elaine Aaron published a book, Highly Sensitive People, and she brings the concepts of highly sensitive people into the mainstream. In her research, she suggests that 15 to 20 percent of the population are highly sensitive. And it's just as likely amongst women as it is amongst men. So they have a more reactive immune system and nervous system. So they have a physiological and psychological reactions to stimuli. What's actually happening in the brain? I'm not sure. I think there were earlier research, the earliest research around people who are sensitive come from a psychologist uh, called Jerome Kagan. So all the way back in, nine, in the 1980s, I think he studied infants and he realized that a portion of babies are much more reactive to stimulation, such as strong smell, loud noises. They also tend to be more distressed by the intrusion of strangers. And their reactions have a biochemical basis. It seems that their brain have a higher level of neuropinthrine, which is our brain's version of adrenaline, and stress hormones like cortisol. Yeah, I don't know much about brain science. I'm afraid I'm really not an expert in that area. But it may be that they, people with a high cognitive ability also have a hyperreactive central nervous system. So their brain processes information much quicker because of the denser connection. But again, I'm really an outsider on this knowledge. Yeah, I think that that'll be interesting just to see over time how that research develops. Um, also, you mentioned the term temperament, and I feel like not a lot of people know what that actually means unless you like take a psych 101 class or something. So could you explain a little bit what temperament is? We're all born with a unique temperament, and it refers to individual differences that are, number one, biologically based. Number two, probably it reveals itself quite early in life. I think if you were a mother, you would see that, you know, baby A and baby B both come from you, seem to have very different personalities that has got nothing to do with you. And usually these remain stable for over time. Emotional intensity, high sensitivity, and the tendency to be hyper-empathic, in my opinion, are temperament, temperamental traits. It could be exacerbated by nurture factor, you know, factors in the later life. But I do think there are brain differences that follow, we, follow us from the get-go. It's important because I think more and more people are talking about neurodiversity nowadays that we're all born differently and it needs to be respected and celebrated. So, uh, you know, knowing to respect individual differences, I think it's where psychology and the world ought to be going. And it also really just helps us in interpersonal dynamic, you know, knowing that this is the way I am, this is the way you are, and how we can negotiate our space together. That is a very important endeavor to live in this social world. The very popular personality infantry, MBTI, for example, is based on temperamental differences. And people have found tremendous benefits from just knowing their type, figuring out what their partners are and how they can key together um, and work well together. Yeah, I think um, knowing and being able to identify why you feel the way you feel is super comforting 
and I feel like that's like a first step to the healing process Mm. um so yeah I think that's really important um you mentioned highly highly sensitive people and Elaine Aron and I um you know I'm more familiar with being a highly sensitive person um and you know I knew that about myself and then I came across your work um and came across the term emotional intensity Mm. so I was wondering where does high sensitivity and emotional intensity where do they um intersect sure now thank you very much for asking that as i said my personal journey also started from many years ago finding well many years ago 10 years ago finding um aaron's work and feeling oh wow this is me i'm so touched but then gradually as i gone on the journey and i've got as i've gone on the journey a little more i feel that doesn't sufficiently capture who i am nor does it sufficiently capture the characteristics of people that I work with. So that, that's when I coined the term emotional intensity and started to want to branch out a little bit. So I feel I've added the dimensions of rigor, speed, passion, and excitabilities to the description of an intense person. In the original concept, sensitive individuals are described as easily startled, very sensitive to pain, easily rattled, so it's, it's a lot of the self-help book and advice of therapists that works with HSPs, highly sensitive people, advise them to limit stimulations, to almost bubble wrap themselves a little, to avoid getting overwhelmed. But I think if you are intense, that advice is just not sufficient because you can be understimulated and get really bored and lose the sense of flow. And that is as problematic as being overstimulated. For instance, a lot of intense people feel dissatisfied in the relationship because it's understimulating. Or they get burned out because things are too mundane and intellectually too easy for them. So in these scenarios, some degree of challenges, even competitions or being in the spotlight can be good for them. So it's really a balancing act for the intense person. And I also observed its overlap with giftedness, intellectual giftedness, and how they, you know, they are also very easily excited on all on all fronts. So it's not just sensitive, but it's also intense. That's how I differentiate the two. So high sensitivity and emotional intensity are terms that describe personality traits, but I feel like, you know, some of the behaviors that go along with these traits are very similar to different mental illnesses. And I'm wondering, how does a person know if they are experiencing a mental illness like anxiety or if they're experiencing emotional intensity or high sensitivity hard to tell and obviously i mean nowadays we live in a culture that is quite emotion phobic you know we quite shy away from anyone saying they're down i think it's getting better but by and large, we, and especially in particular cultures, it's very much about silencing negative feelings. And when I say negative, it's not that they are fundamentally negative. It's just that the culture deemed them to be negative, like sadness or fear or particularly anger. When you're intense, however, the normative strategies of just denying and brushing off and dampening things don't seem to work. It seems that your friends can say, oh, you just don't think too much. Just go get a drink. Just have some snacks. You'll feel better. Go get a walk. A lot of intense people don't find these strategies very helpful. They also don't find a lot of help from conventional. Well, they do find help, but limited help from conventional therapies like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. 
So that would make them look like they have an out of the norm reaction to things already. And another factor is the field of psychology is based on social science, quantitative social science. So the definition definition of mental health is very much dependent on how well a person adapts to social norm. You know, putting the same symptoms in a completely different time and culture, a person would be considered completely normal. But because there's a normative culture and the intense people operate slightly outside of it, so your normal may seem neurotic and obsessive to others. Some of the common labels are borderline personality, bipolar disorder, and ADHD because of their speed and the emotional intensity for the intense person. But obviously, I absolutely do not want to diminish the value of getting a mental health diagnosis because they can be life-saving, so can medications. But very often, intense people are being labeled with such or even being scapegoated as such, where there's no real pathology, where they're actually just more expressive and more intense, or they may be more in touch with the darker side of our collective consciousness because of their empathy. You know, we can argue that given the, the way the world is, it's probably normal to feel depressed rather than jolly. So in a way, they are like the canary in the coal mine. They are just feeling what is supposed to be felt and others are denying. We can argue that. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. I think that's also a, a more positive way to look at it because... I can definitely feel like hearing all of this could make a person who experiences the world in this way feel a little self-conscious and bad about themselves because it it feels like there's almost no escape. (laughs) Like people who are emotionally intense and highly sensitive, it's like the stimulus that we're taking in is so much and sometimes we can't control that so how do we function in the world if we can't control all the stimuli that we're taking in and that's overwhelming us so yeah i'm just wondering like do you have any hopeful words or any like positive things that this trait allows people to do absolutely yeah no it is a gift in itself as i often say It is hard to, especially when you were younger and you didn't have the emotional skills to navigate the complex and intense emotional landscape. But these things can be learned in therapy, can be trained. And one thing to do is learning to befriend your emotions. And, you know, real emotional health is not about a kind of stoicism. Well, actually, stoicism is pretty good as a philosophy, but it's not about just being stony. It's about your ability to expand and absorb and the willingness to say yes to both your emotions and things that are happening. So allow things to move you and move you deeply, but without losing your ground completely. If you can do that, you can harness your sensitivity and empathy as gifts because the world is calling for it. The world is craving empathic and sensitive leaders. Um, There's a lot that sensitive people and intense people can offer the world they have lots of leadership qualities thank you for that i think that's something a lot of us need to hear that we don't hear and might not ever hear so in your practice do you have a specific approach to coaching and treating people Mm. who are emotionally intense Sure. I look at it on a holistic way. So I, as I said, it starts from helping people befriend their emotions and have a maybe expand what I call the window of tolerance to embrace their feelings a bit more without drowning in them or pushing them away. Then a big part of my work is learning to help people heal from the wounds that they have experienced in the past, either from their peers or from their family of origins who didn't get them. Being an apple that has fallen far from the trees can really hurt us in many invisible ways. Not only that they may be very different to their parents and that their parents didn't get them, they may also be very different to their siblings. Um, 
So that in itself is like a lifelong feeling of loneliness and shame that we need to work to heal. And then I help people to look at their current interpersonal relationships, like their intimate relationships and their work dynamic. For example, they may have big ups and downs with their partners. They may be bored and restless. And at work, I teach people to look at some of the dynamics that's going on beneath the surface so they can make sense of their experience without always thinking that it's because they're too intense. So I draw from attachments and psychodynamic theories and help people to learn how to undo the unhealthy patterns that hold them back. So do you find that um, for people who are emotionally intense, talk therapy works over like body work? I think they can. I'm not a, psych, uh, a somatic therapist, so I mainly do talk therapy. I think it can. I think these things can all work together, and I always encourage people to shop around and to find whatever that might work. I think th- this is just so interesting to me because it does feel like a newer area of like study and research, and I think it's really cool and helpful that you're doing this work specifically for us who feel like this because we don't get recognized for sure. So next I want to kind of talk about what's going on right now. Right now we're (laughs) doing this interview remotely because of the pandemic and we're also in different locations, but um, we've all been isolated a lot because of the pandemic and I know that affects everyone in some way so I'm wondering what the effect of like the social isolation is on people who are emotionally intense and if you've seen any patterns or behaviors in your clients since all of this has started. Sure well frankly definitely not to make light of the situation but many of my clients are actually feeling quite okay with the extra space and solitude. So a lot of my clients are actually secretly enjoying the solitude and the space mm. that is that has been given. So they, I think in the past, they find that they need to find many excuses to escape mindless social engagements, but they find that they no longer have to. But obviously that is the mini fortunate in myriads of very unfortunate events. Intense people often feel very deeply into the pain of the world because of their empathic nature. They also feel injustice very deeply. So they probably find the news very overwhelming. And people in their immediate surrounding may not get why they're reacting so strongly to things in the wider world. But that leaves them feeling quite lonely. Another thing is being in solitude confinement with your family does not necessarily set up for an easy mental Mm -hmm. health. You know, they may have taken on other people's emotions, such as their partners or family members' anxiety. And it can happen anywhere. You know, as I said earlier, their empathic nature causes them to pick up on other people's emotions and be affected. And it happens especially strongly when you are with someone who you're in in an intimate relationship with or if you're still family members. So if your partner is not happy, you probably pick it up and get very affected by it. Even when they say they're not unhappy, you can sense it. That makes the whole situation quite tiring and overwhelming for them because they are not only caring for their own anxiety, but also emotionally caretaking their family members unknowingly. Yeah. So these are some of the challenges, new challenges that they're facing. Okay. So... Something you've um, mentioned a few times is just how there can be some struggles with family when someone is intense. And I know how an HSP is treated um, as a child is very important to their development and just the dynamic of the home. And you mentioned on your website just how you had parents who didn't attend to your intensity. So I'm wondering, what's the dynamic of relationships between families and their highly sensitive and emotionally intense That's a very good question. Um, 
there are various dynamics that can happen depending on the situation and their parents' limitations. One very common one is parentifications. That's when you become the emotional or even physical caretaker for your parents. Maybe they are preoccupied, maybe they're mentally ill, or maybe they are not very well themselves. So it's very easy for the emotionally mature and sensitive child to then step up to become their parents' counselor, confidant, or to care for their siblings because they are empathic. And it's very tempting also to use the sensitive child for that purpose because they seem to be such good receptive listener. So that's one dynamic. Another one might be that they are scapegoated because of how different they are. It's very easy to say, oh, you know, everything happens because, you know, she's the Vivian is the sensitive one because she's the hard one. She's the difficult one. And for the family to point fingers at one person and make her the target, him or her the target. Yeah, there, there are various things that goes on, but scapegoating and parentification are two very common ones. So how would you suggest someone navigate their relationship with families um, so that they aren't experiencing so much suffering? Mm. Uh, there are many layers of work one could do. Mm, I think on a more immediate level, maybe setting boundaries would be helpful in separating themselves from their families and really healing from the need to caretake. Because if your, fam if your family members have been suffocating and golving, or they have violated your boundaries from a young age, you may not know how to stand up for yourself and say no. So doing that is an important first step to individuate, to walk, walk away without the guilt tripping and the manipulation. I think seeing the truth clearly is a big step for many people, which is not often easy. It, it not it often not easy because it comes with a lot of feelings from anger to sadness to grief that needs to be digested and processed. Therapy can be helpful. Healing work can be helpful. I will never say anyone needs to forgive their family. That is always optional. And the goal of it is not for others, but for to relieve yourself of a lifelong burden of carrying and resentment. But if the time is mature and one feels ready for the work, I think releasing the past hurt so we can move on would be a significant piece. Okay. So continuing to talk about relationships, um, what do you notice in emotionally intense people when it comes to intimate or romantic relationships? Gosh, that's a whole article in itself. Um, <laughs> so I've written an article about it. And okay. there are lots of things that happen. For instance, they feel bored and restless because they feel their partner can't keep up with them. They may find that they need a lot of time for solitude. They may be very sensitive physically and their partner may not be able to understand it. They often look for a lot of depth in our increasingly shallow online dating world. Mm. They also pick up and absorb their partner's emotions and maybe they interpret things. Yeah. And they may, there might be communication differences because of the temperament difference. So I often encourage people to think about the concept of a soulmate and a life partner. You know, they may not be able to have them as the same person, and that may be okay. Because it would be very hard for an intense people to find that one unicorn who meets all their needs emotionally, physically, intellectually, psycho spiritually. You know, it's it's just difficult. So maybe it's okay to have a life partner to meet some of your needs and find nourishment elsewhere. Diversify the sources of your nutrients, as I would say. Okay. So now you've talked about so much great stuff, and I don't think a lot of people know about this, so I think it's really important that we have this discussion. And I want to provide um, listeners who are emotionally intense or just want to learn more with some resources. So do you have any suggestions for resources? Yeah, I wish there are more voice around the, voices about these topics too. A lot has been written about highly sensitive people and empaths on giftedness so people can go around and look at these concepts. 
you can come to my website. A lot of the concepts that we discussed today are on there. My website is www.eggshelltherapy.com. I, in 2018, I started a project where I recruited stories. I had about a hundred of them from people who are intense and sensitive. So they submitted their life stories and give advice to each other. I think it's just valuable resources so people can go on there and look at other people's stories. Some may resonate, some may not, but you can also see what helps others. Okay. And lastly, how can, you know, me and my audience stay up to date with you and all the work that you're doing? Sure. So I have my website and I also have a newsletter. I only release something when I have something to share now, but (laughs) usually once a month or maybe once every two months, I write newsletters in these news, uh, in these letters that I send. So I call them letters to the emotional intense souls. I also have a podcast where I interview survivors, experts, psychologists uh, on these topics called Eggshell Transformations. I'm sure you can find Eggshell Transformations by searching it in iTunes or something, but you can also find all of these from my website. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. For me, this was very insightful and I definitely learned about myself and I want to keep exploring this part of myself so thank you for kind of opening that door for me and again I think this will be something new um, and important for people to hear about yeah yeah so thank you again for being here no worries (laughs) it's really lovely to be with you you're doing good work keep it up thank you I'm trying my best Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Students of Mind. Please be sure to follow Emmy and visit her website, eggshelltherapy.com. For links to resources mentioned in this episode, look at the description. Also, please subscribe, share, and leave a review for this podcast. Otherwise, thank you again for listening, and we will see you next episode.